you'll see that I've brought some other books. I'm sitting next to one of my teachers. Uh, I haven't known Orville in person that long, but I've been reading his work for a very long time. Discos and Democracy, Mandate of Heaven. And even before that, he produced these readers on China, talking about all sorts of subjects, including the question of wealth and power. We're so fortunate to have you with us today. Well, thanks, Clay. It's nice to be here. And everybody wants wealth and power. What makes China different? Well, you know, I think, uh, of course, everybody wants wealth and power, but uh, the Chinese case is unique because, historically speaking, I mean, it fell from such a sort of a towering height of supremacy during the Qing Dynasty. And by the, you know, the 19th century, uh, as it became aware of the, its inability to defend itself against the great powers, na namely the Europeans and ultimately the Japanese, who were the most predatory of all, uh, this feeling of weakness and of, of the humiliation that was sort of accompanied this feeling of being unable to even repel foreign exploitation and predation was very, very deep. And it was out of that whole experience, which lasted a century, uh, that this fabric of, uh, was woven of China as the aggrieved party and this kind of fierce determination to someday, somehow, make it up and claw their way back up the ladder of success to a point where they could neither be pushed around, bullied, exploited. And they, in that process, trying to get up there, they tried on many different guises, many different uh, ways of, of governing themselves, philosophies, economic systems, in, in a hope of finding something that would create a restoration of this idea of wealth and power, which, by the way, is a very ancient couplet of characters, Fu Chang in Chinese. It goes back thousands of years and represents a whole sort of tradition that lived in parallel to Confucianism, but that's another somewhat complicated story that you can read about in the book. You talk some about how really that period of humiliation became the defining force for, for how they thought of themselves, and could you describe that evolution somewhat? Yeah, it's very odd, Jeff. I mean, for us who are Westerners, who, uh, you know, date the beginning of our nations from the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Glorious Revolution in England. I mean, these were moments of sort of triumph, victory, things may have changed, but they weren't moments of defeat. They weren't mo moments of ignominy. And the Chinese, on the other hand, date the beginning of their modern, sort of modern time from the Opium Wars, where China was forced to confront Britain and lost big time and had thrust upon it the first of a whole series of what they called the unequal treaties. And so it was out of that very odd, different experience that, that this sense of being aggrieved uh, grew, and then it hooked up with communism, and one of the main aspects that Lenin contributed to that whole bouquet of thinking was the imperialist world of the great powers survives by exploiting the third world, the developing world. And so these things dovetailed very nicely. And thus you had the whole Chinese Communist movement, which in terms of its sort of foreign view of China's place in the world was very much one of China the oppressed. And it's striking, of course, uh, early in the 20th century, you had people like Weber who wanted to explain why China was not a world power, why India was not a world power. And he was trying to explain these kinds of things. But you're not focusing on what foreigners have to say about China. You're focusing on what Chinese have said about China. And so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that internal discussion and the people that you chose to focus on in this book. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we in the West tend to have an incredibly Western view of history. I mean, we imagine history as sort of ineluctably leading towards greater openness, freedom, even democracy. I mean, this is our Enlightenment 
genetic makeup at work. And it's also Hegel, you know, where the history is moving towards this supreme ultimate of greater freedom. And, you know, we've applied this rather recklessly around the world. And do you remember uh, the end of history? Francis Fukuyama? Well, I mean, history seemed to end with the end of the Cold War, and then it kind of started up again. And it was actually the Chinese, in a, in a significant measure, that started it up again. And so the question then arises, where is Chinese history going? Where, 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 where are the Chinese trying to get? Uh, and this was what sort of drove me and my uh, co-author, John Delory, back into this history that we'd spent our whole lives studying. But I have to tell you, never really made much sense out of it. So this was a kind of a privilege, and to see through that history, that flow of this urgent sense of China wanting not only to be wealthy and powerful, but most important, to regain global respect. You know, you, Orville, your, you, your own history, your own history is an important part of the history of China that you're talking about here. And you've seen an evolution in China, that's been, or a revolution that's quite extraordinary. But when you started studying China, Mao was in power. And you talk about how, in some odd way, Mao's regime actually made it possible for China to ascend as it has. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, this is an amazing paradox. Well, uh, as you point out, when I first went to China, Mao was alive. Cultural Revolution was going on, and I remember arriving in Beijing and very excited because we had been shut out as Americans for so many years and living uh, in the one, there was one high-rise building in the entire city of Beijing. And those of you who've been here now know that it would be a fool's errand to even try to count the high-rise buildings in Beijing. And um, at that point, it seemed like that was China. You know, everybody in a Mao suit, not an advertisement in the whole country, not a single private car, very few cars at all. There was not one single solitary business in the whole country. Everything was in people's communes in the countryside. Uh, and to try to have imagined then what China would, would, was like now would have made you seem as if you, you were bereft of your senses. But the point I, I, I think I, I want to make in, in describing that past is what an amazing story that this country that was at one point one thing transformed itself into something else that is almost opposite in so many different ways. There are many constants, of course, that sort of flow beneath the changes. But this, again, was the sort of the experience of China trying things on. You know, they had the imperial system with the emperor, that failed. The dynasty collapsed in 1911, 1912. Then they tried republicanism, you know, Sun Yat-sen, and that ended in a total catastrophe, in feudalism, warlords, disunity, a country that was broken. Then you got Chiang Kai-shek, a kind of a curious confection of Confucianism, Christianity, you know, his wife been to Wellesley, was a deeply ardent Christian. Uh, a very strange uh, 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 sort of combination of things. He got chased off to Taiwan. You got Mao Zedong with a Marxist revolution transmogrified through his own unique thinking. Mao dies, along comes Deng Xiaoping and says, you know, hold the order. Let's cancel the revolution, at least economically speaking. Let's try it again. And you got reform and opening up and you see the results of that now, you know, 25 years later. So this is a country that has been in the process of serial self-reinvention in a way that raises some very fundamental questions about, you remember that scene in Pierre Gint where he's sitting on the stage and he's peeling an onion. He's trying to get down to the heart of the matter and of course onions are just endless layers that end nowhere. And in a certain sense, you know, China has had to deal with that question of what's at the heart of this proposition? Where, where are we going? Where are we trying to get? But what you can say is wherever that is, they're going there at a terrifyingly dynamic speed. You know, that's certainly the case. I was, I was going to ask what success looks like because none of the authors 
really give us the vision of what wealth, a wealthy and powerful China is, except that it's not what exists today. You know, what does this great power? But I'm not going to ask you that right now. Let's go back to Jeff's question, because you make the point, you and John make the point, that Deng is made possible by Mao, that Mao's destruction makes Deng's construction possible. Could you say something about that? Yeah, uh, this is a tremendous paradox, and Jeff, you, you asked this, and forgive me for not having uh, also answered it. Um, you know, we think of Mao, particularly in the West, as sort of the Shiva destroyer god who came in and just wrecked the place. Class warfare, incredible brutality and violence, and any Chinese who lived through it will have had some horrendous story to, re to, to, to remember. And all of that was true. But looking back on it, there's an interesting wrinkle to this, this kind of narrative. Um, all of the people from the fall of the Qing dynasty to uh, really the middle part of the century had struggled and really <coughs> struggled hard, and, but with a certain futility to break China loose from its old Confucian culture. Why? Because they saw that as suffocating strangling the country, preventing it from becoming dynamic, and most important, preventing it from being able to modernize, technologize, to defend itself. And nobody succeeded. And what's so interesting about the people we all chronicle is almost every single one of them struggle, fight, revolution against their past, men that were trained in the classics to take the exams and become officials in the imperial government, when they get old, what do they do? They go back to tradition. They go back to writing Tang poetry. They go back to studying classical philology, philosophy. It's so deeply in their bones. And Mao, he had the same dilemma, but Mao was a tough son of a bitch. And he launched a cultural revolution the likes of which the world has never seen. And I think it would be fair to say he did finally put a stake through the heart of traditional Chinese culture. Not totally, to be sure, but at least as, as this kind of governing mechanism that had China so, so immobilized in the past. I'm curious, oh, uh, so that is sort of a constructive aspect of Mao, and you'll all recall Joseph Schumpeter, mm -hmm. uh, who had this notion of creative destruction but this was in capitalism, and he thought the virtues of capitalism were that it kept, keeps destroying itself and thereby regenerating. And Mao was very much of that notion. He had this idea of permanent revolution, always their contradictions fighting amongst themselves. But each time one wins, you gain a higher stage. And so he had this kind of very dynamic dialectical notion of, of progress, which is very much like Schumpeter. So, you know, I don't want to apologize for the Cultural Revolution, but I think you can say there was an element of creative destruction. And he had this expression in Chinese, you know, bu po bu li. If you don't destroy, you can't create. So I want to pick up on, on the onion for a minute, following from this. A lot of destruction, onion, you keep going toward the middle of the onion, there's nothing there. One of the haunting questions you ask, I think, at the end of the book is, and maybe you could talk a little about, what values are there? Let me ask you that, Jeff. Now, you, you're not a China specialist, but you did do this, and I still don't understand how you were able to do it. But Jeff wrote this amazing play about Watergate. And lo and behold... Pentagon Papers. Pentagon Papers, excuse me. Uh, and lo and behold, it's plays in, in, in China. So. Two rounds, yeah, two rounds, back for second round. So if you look at that experience, what, what do you, th what, how did you interpret what the value well, well, I'll say something very, very short about it, because this is really your stage, but it was an amazing thing, and the incredible thing, this is about a free press, it's the, it's the story of the Pentagon Papers told through the story of the Washington Post. So it's about the importance of a free press and an independent judiciary. And it went to China, paid for by the State Department, in terrific venues last year when I was there with it, they brought it back again this year, and as you know, Orville, 
among other things, it was the Egg Theater, the most spectacular theater in Beijing, on June 4th, 5th, and 6th. June 4th, as you know so well, being the 24th anniversary of Tiananmen. Here it is in Beijing at their top theater. And to me, kind of amazingly, on the 6th, it's performing there on the same day that the president of China arrives in Ontario Airport, and I greet him. Amazing to me. Anyway. Why? Because well, How was, did this happen? Why did the play go to China? Why did it happen in your... Yeah. I think China's struggling with this question. And so when I was there a year, a year ago with the play and traveled all over the country with it, in conversations, I found audiences in law schools and in, and in journalism schools genuinely struggling with this issue. It wasn't that they said we should be like the United States, but they knew that some kind of freedom was necessary. And the way the Chinese would explain it, the Chinese government leaders who I talked about, what they'd say is, they were worried about corruption, for example. And that they, they felt ultimately the only way to undo corruption was to have it be exposed, whether it was through the press or through Weibo or something like that. So that a certain amount of freedom of speech is necessary to achieve the goals that they believed in. And they described stories like this. So I, and the, at the same time, they know, and Orville, you've written about this so much over the years and experienced it. There's a point to which that kind of freedom can be so dangerous for them. So I, I can't explain it except to say that I think that inside of China there is that, there is at least one movement that we should be celebrating, which is an effort to have a certain kind of freedom. Yeah, and I think sometimes, actually, uh, a certain indirection is allowable where direction is m more difficult. So if this were about, uh, you know, the, a Pentagon Papers case in China, that would be something else. But I think it was, by the way, pretty delightful for them that at the very end of the run, the Edward Snowden thing occurred, <laughs> and they could begin to say, how perfect are you after all? Yeah, I mean, that, that I have to say, established a strangely uh, delicious equivalence for the Chinese, you know, because here they were getting beat up on daily for, uh, uh, you know, violating sort of internet protocol, Cyber hacking. Cyber or hacking, one thing or another. And then suddenly Snowden appears in Hong Kong, revealing that the United States didn't do exactly the same thing because there, there was no allegations that there was private companies hacked into or in theft of intellectual property. But there was a, the question of equality is always an important one in Chinese negotiations. So this established a kind of a, a, a more level playing field. Now, speaking of indirection, can I go back to the question of what core values do you see emerging in China? Well, I find this uh, very perplexing because as I say, there's been this sort of uh, serial attempts to reinvent not just the political system and the economic system, but a value system. And now we have a kind of a strange efflorescence of traditional thinking to bring back Confucius, who was once the arch enemy of the Chinese Communist Revolution, as if to say, there's a little bit of a vacuum here we need to fill. What, what, what can we get our hands on to kind of, we need some sort of core belief system. But I don't think it's very clear at all what that core belief system is. And it's one reason, in my view, that there's a resurgence of interest, uh, particularly in Tibetan Buddhism and Christianity in China. The people are feeling a fundamental uh, emptiness. Wealth and power is attained in some significant new measure. And now what? What do you think, Clay? <laughs> what do I think? The, well, the several points that were made, I think with regard to Jeff's play, the fact that it is about Nixon and those sorts of things, I think that's what makes it possible, is that it's about the United States, it's about problems in the United States. Uh, the triumphant aspect of uh, the Supreme Court intervening and permitting a free press, uh, I'm not sure that's the central message that uh, some people were trying to get across. And it's also about Vietnam and maybe yeah, exactly. we weren't perfect there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all, all about that sort of thing, taking the American people into a war, that sort of thing. So it fits with Iraq, it fits with a number of other things. So there's a lot probably going on. I, I very much take the point that you've made about Mao as well, with regard to Mao 
going full tilt at Chinese culture, broadly defined, and having such a destructive impact on it. But also, in fact, there were positive things that happened during the Mao years with regard to laying an economic infrastructure in place, roads, canals, those kinds of things. So that definitely happened. But let's come back to this question of values. Because the people you write about for the, in the 19th century, it's all about, they have better guns than we do. The foreigners have better guns. And they're aware that it's not just possible to buy the guns. They want to be able to make those guns and to make better guns. And so they're aware of an infrastructure. Uh, there needs to be some sort of infrastructure in place. And some of the people you write about make some connections to participatory government and those kinds of things. Uh, but none of them, until we get to Liu Xiaobo, starts ag advocating for those things. And maybe that's one of the questions here. Is it possible for China to be wealthy and powerful simply by focusing on technology and maybe being a little bit more open, but not permitting these other things? Well, this, this raises the very sort of provocative question of have the Chinese come up with a new model? You know, we used to have this notion that uh, political openness, namely democracy, was an absolute critical element of sort of economic, real, dynamic, and sustained economic development. We thought these things belonged together. Then the Chinese went out and they uh, sort of disproved that, at least until now. And I have to say, you know, I was in China in 1989 when all the demonstrations were taking place and standing in the middle of Tiananmen Square and watching what was going on, you know, a million plus people roiling into the square and everything being broadcast live on television and, and people speaking with complete freedom. It was unthinkable at the time that China would ever reinstate the Chinese Communist Party and get this train back on the rails, the old rail bed, much less that they would 20 years later be in talking about an E2 with the United States, a G2. Uh, so th th this is rather, rather surprising. Um, and you know, I think it does bespeak, as I say, of this sort of deep yearning to make something not just of themselves, which is the American dream, but of their country, which is really what the so-called new Chinese dream is all about. Orville, in, in a minute, I know Clay is going to turn this to the audience for questions, but I can't leave my part of the questioning without asking about something that is also one of those questions that hangs over the book. Wealth and power, as you describe it, today is sort of a wealth and protecting what we have, wealth and being strong enough for self-defense. It's, it's the War Department becoming the Defense Department. But it wasn't always so, and it might always not always be so. Could you talk a bit about the meaning of power and wealth and power? Yeah, a very interesting question, Jeff, because the, the word qiang, power, uh, we traditionally translate it as power. But it's actually, in the Chinese context, at least until now, I think it would be fair to translate it as strength. So prosperity and strength would be a, 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 a more accurate translation. And I think for China during the last 150 years, it's mostly been identified with the sort of defensive need. Defend ourselves. Keep the Japanese out. Keep the British out. We want to run our country on our own terms. But now we arrive at a kind of a very interesting inflection point where this wealth and this power have been accomplished in some measure. And there is a real temptation amongst people who were bullied when they get the power to do likewise, to put the shoe on the other foot. And I think there's going to be a tremendously, it's going to be tremendous temptation for China. And we may see a little suggestion of that in the way they deport themselves now in relation to their neighbors on all these island disputes. Uh, 
I think there, as just described, there's always this struggle going on within China between conflicting impulses. And I, I think this is the great challenge of this next decade in terms of China's foreign policy, whether it can restrain its newly arrived at military power, which is very satisfying to most Chinese who are deeply nationalistic and patriotic, and use it in the old sense of strength, not kind of aggressive power. Yeah, the, the Fu Chang translation, that question, because that, not just to defend, but to get equity, right? Uh, to a certain amount of payback. Uh, very quickly, just another translation question. You folks choose to translate uh, Ne Luan as internal anxiety. And most people translate the Luan as disorder or chaos, something along those lines. And I was wondering, I, I would assume that it somehow fits with the psychological focus or something like this, but could you speak to that? The question that uh, many of the people that Orville looks at, uh, Orville and John look at, they're concerned with internal disorder or uh, internal anxiety is the way they render it, and external threat. Yeah, fair question. I would say it's an anxiety over disorder. I and mean, if there's one thing that Chinese get <laughs> anxious about, it's the idea of, uh, you know, bu wen ding, instability. And they have this big campaign now to kind of support and maintain stability. So the nightmare, not only now, but historically speaking, is when you have rebellions within your country and you have attacks from without. And this is something that happened periodically, but interestingly enough, in the dynastic period, the attacks always came from you know, the Manchus, the Mongols, the Xiongnu, the Tibetans, these wild kind of uh, tribesmen that existed uh, inland. And then suddenly the Brits arrive via the sea. And it was a different kind of barbarian. And uh, it, it created this deep-rooted feeling that they were unraveling both inside and from outside. One last question, then we'll go to the audience. And this goes to the question of victimhood, something that you've been writing about for many years and is very much a part of this, a part of this book, the, the sense of vulnerability. And as you describe it, victimhood or humiliation is a mobilization tool. And it might also, of course, be seen today as an offensive tactic as a way of putting the other side on the defensive, saying all the things you have done to us, you have no right now to judge us in any way, shape, or form. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the balance today. China is not going to get pushed around by anyone. Nobody's pushing China around. Why still hold on to this victim mentality? Yeah, you know, you, you, you well might ask if the predominant urge amongst Chinese is to be equal, how can they, on the other hand, proclaim themselves as victims? Because victims are never equal. Victims are always being preyed upon and inferior. So they, they run into a little problem here, whereas the old narrative of victimization by the world, uh, suddenly they are becoming a great power themselves. And they always say, oh, no, 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 no. You know, we're not quite ready to be a real stakeholder in the world. We're, we're, we're still a developing country, not so fast. Uh, and there is also a tendency to want to kind of cling on to this idea that they're still somehow being preyed on by the world. And it has terrible, uh, terribly complicating effects in foreign policy because for instance, they very readily imagine that the United States is still in a Cold War trying to encircle and contain them. This is all part of that. So I would say, Clay, you know, just as a final kind of comment on your question, I think another great challenge of the new leadership, which just came into office, they have 10 years to go, is to change the narrative. But I also think you know, some of you all had parents that maybe grew up as children in the Depression. That was an experience they never forgot. 
Some of them, they, they just can't, there's no amount of wealth which is sufficient to make them feel secure. And the whole generation of people went on just piling up more and more and more because of that deep fundamental psychological insecurity from their sort of foundational experience. And I think China's had something similar to that, so it's gonna take a generation or two with reality being different for people to gain a new kind of psychological presumption about how they fit into the world. But this will happen, I hope, but it is here that wise leadership is so critical. And it is here that Chinese nationalism, if sort of uh, manipulated and excited by leaders, can be quite, uh, I think, harmful. Thank you. And so one of, the, one of the issues, of course, with regard to the victimization is what happens when nobody else sees you as victim, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that is a problem, yeah. you know. I think we've all known people like that. Okay, we, we are turning now to the audience questions. What we'll try to do is get people to enunciate the question clearly are there and briefly. I'll, I'll distribute this microphone. If you call on people, I'll give my call. Oh, okay. Uh, but what we'll, what we'll try to do is get maybe two or three questions together and then move on. So, uh, If you can remember them, Clay. <laughs> we'll do our best. And maybe introduce yourself. Please. Thank you. Please uh, identify yourself. Hi, we met before at the Hong Kong conference. <laughs> There's... Great a few people here who Super. may not know you. All right. Um, my question is... No, I'm sorry? Tell us who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Gregory Santana, and um, I retired from the media, and so I have an interest in international relations, so I attend conferences just to enjoy learning. Um, my question is, Tiananmen Square occurred almost 30 years ago, and the young leaders at that time hid away quietly is not to avoid the senior leadership that step on them. But now they're coming into the stage of control. My question is, are they quietly, silently making changes that maybe they had endeared in, in 1990, 1980, 1989, I believe it was, and to move China forward? And my second part of the question is, where do you see the possibility of that or any other for the next 20 years? That's a big enough question maybe by itself. What, how, how is Tiananmen understood, and what happens now 24 years later? How are people acting on that memory? You know, the Chinese have a notion of, uh, in Chinese it's, you know, ping fan, to rehabilitate someone, or to reverse the verdict on a piece of history that was once officially viewed one way and then gets changed to being viewed another. They have not rehabilitated the verdict on Tiananmen, uh, 1989 yet. Uh, they will. It's a very, it was a very, very painful period in Chinese history, whatever side you were on. And it was also a, a moment which I think, even though you might say and, uh, that the demonstrations were peaceful and justified and, and legal and all of these things, it did have a very deleterious effect on China's reform, ability to reform, because it scared the party so much that when they got back into uh, a firm grip on things, they thought we should never let this kind of expression happen again. But there is a, you know, the, the great uh, Chinese writer Lu Xun, who's one of the best, sort of most renowned 20th century short story writers and essays, after a, a massacre of many fewer people in Tiananmen Square in 1926 uh, uh, said something quite interesting. He said, you know, lies uh, uh, or, or, or truths written in blood can never be expunged by lies written in ink. And this is a problem. The party has to keep adjusting its history. Uh, and they do change their mind. And ultimately, history has a verdict which is completely free of any sort of manipulation of any government. And so this will happen. It just hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And of course, one of the things associated with the demonstrations in Tiananmen is that was when the Soviet Union was coming back to China. And Gorbachev was there. And Gorbachev has become for Chinese leaders to be the, in a certain sense, the, the anti-example. You loosen up, you get kicked out of power. You know, perestroika, is the road to certain ruin 
if you're a good Communist Party uh, member. And so that's a, exactly what communist leaders do not want to see happen to China. They do not want to see China fall apart the way the Soviet Union did. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, we have two fellows in, the, in blue shirts. We'll go with the, this fellow and then the one behind him. Yeah, uh, my name is Xiao Feng. I'm from uh, EDI Media Incorporation in the Los Angeles. Uh, my question is, actually, I didn't read your book yet, but I read your article. That's uh, published in the Wall Street Journal in the weekend section, July 13, right? Uh, a right thing, China, a need a new national stories. In your uh, conclusion, you make your conclusion, China need a new uh, national stories, but you didn't tell us why and how. Can you tell us? Well, okay. the national story, and we've sort of been discussing this, is one of victimization. And I think actually uh, China can now reasonably um, uh, uh, expect to be able to tell a national story of success, of greater success, not complete. There are many, many weaknesses still within the system as in any country or society. And, you know, China will someday hit a big, road bump the way every country, every economy, every political system does, including the United States. But I do think that uh, it's going to have to sort of change the way it looks at itself if it expects to feel comfortable or more comfortable in the world. And if it expects to actually attain the, the level of equality that it really, I think, has yearned for, in which this is really what this book we wrote is about, China trying to become equal again, or even better than equal, admired. Confident. Pardon? Confident. Confident. Confident, but not arrogant. I mean, we have had a little experience in this country with the difference between confidence and arrogance, and we know where arrogance gets us, at least some people do. <laughs> and at, what, at what point? Uh, do you find success? Please. One of the things that's always been fundamental in China is, oh, I'm Jamie Soames, hi. Um, one of the things that has always been a, a factor or a flavor of Chinese culture is food and the importance of food. And one of the things I was wondering is how the current leadership is going to continue to deal with the subject of food policy and food security, particularly in light of the bursting scandal in the South with the cadmium tainted rice and the depletion of vast quantities of rice growing land. I think you can look at the uh, parlous situation of food in China as a metaphor for the environment in general. And one of the great uh, costs of their extraordinary and successful dynamic development has been a, a, a harm to their environment. And the most sort of organic, if one can say this way, that people are now experiencing that harm to the environment is that it's very difficult to be sure if you're eating something that's safe. And we see this in this sort of almost panic amongst mothers to get infant formula that doesn't come from within China. Uh, I mean, my son is studying there this summer. He, he, he won't eat meat. I mean, but the question is then, what do you eat? Because everything is potentially, but I should say this, that, you know, back in, you know, the days of um, uh, early part of the 20th century, the United States didn't have any uh, regulatory system for food inspection either. And you got lots of powerful kind of muckraking journalism about the meat packing industry and whatnot. Um, you know, I do not happen to be a teabagger, I do not happen to believe that government has no function, and if you actually believe that, I'd say go live in China and eat their food, and you will see the results of a lack of regulation. China is, on the other hand, striving mightily to develop a regulatory system to protect its people from impure food. But this is a huge, a huge growing problem. And it's interesting, New Year's, people used to give, well, they still do, these kind of strange gifts uh, that often have no use in very elaborate, fancy bags. 
there's a new trend now to give a little plastic card. And the plastic card is for organic food. And you simply call up the number and you say, I'd like 10 gin of rice and, you know, two liters of, of oil. And, you know, a few hours later, some guy on a little electric cart comes and he delivers you these organic, this organic food. Great, great progress in my view. So we have the Opium War. We come up to 1949 and Mao reports that things have changed. And so the party's argument is nobody pushes China around anymore. But now it's not external threat, but food safety, polluted water, bad air, those sorts of things. Who's articulating that now in China? Who, is, who are the people who will be included in the next edition of this book? Well, you know, this gets into the whole question, I think, in some measure of civil society, which is often where sort of an environmental movement arises on the margins and then moves slowly inward towards the center of governance. And uh, China has a very, uh, you know, they embrace civil society, and civil society is growing at a very rapid rate uh, and is quite vital, but it has no legal standing yet. And because the party is a little bit wary of independent organizations. So this is a, this is a real problem. Um, and I, I, I don't know how they'll work this out in the end. One other thought, you know, unlike our own country, where we have an awful lot of politicians who are all snarled up in kind of voodoo, right-wing, religious thinking that don't believe in science, and certainly don't believe in evolution or any of those things. China is ruled by technocrats, engineers, scientists who have a pretty decent respect for the deductive process and for the rational ability of, of people to solve problems. So in a funny way, we've kind of traded places with them. Uh, China used to be the land of sort of uh, distorting ideology, you know, Mao talk. And we used to be the land of reason, science, rationalism, get it done. And in a funny way, we've actually, in significant measure, we've traded positions. We have, uh, here, somebody yeah. we have here somebody who's taught about the people in this book. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm Charlotte Firth, and it's really nice to hear you discuss stuff I've worked with over my lifetime. Uh, but there's a continuity that actually is a follow-up from your last comment that I don't think your discussion of the book has brought out sufficiently. Uh, and that has to do with uh, a imperial, Maoist, and contemporary uh, uh, fondness by uh, uh, bureaucratic a statesman for a kind of statescraft that puts a lot of faith in we could call social engineering. Uh, 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 and I think if I wanted to know more about how the Chinese state today worked, I would want to know a good deal more about some of the development projects. We hear about the big ones like, you know, the, the what, the Three Gorges, uh, you know, we can go back to Mao, you know, who had faith in the social engineering to completely revolutionize the land and tenure system and the class system. We can go back to the 18th century, where you had, you know, guided population movements. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and how has all of this translated into a kind of bureaucratic governmentality today that has a lot to say about you know, how China manages its money, how it organizes development projects, um, isn't this something to think about? Well, you know, I think it's fair to say, it's an interesting question that China has always been a, a sort of a top-down society, whether in the Confucian scheme of things with the emperor uh, or in the Communist Party. There's actually a lot of synergy between the way Lenin viewed leadership. He viewed a revolution as needing to be run by what he called professional revolutionaries at the top. Not, not, not the masses, that was Marx, but that was kind of a little chaotic for Lenin. And here, interestingly enough, Chiang Kai-shek, Sun Yat-sen, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, they were all on exactly the same page. They weren't into democracy. They were into, let's unify the country, let's have some strong leaders, and you know, sort of corporate leadership, let's get the job done, let's get this fuchang, this wealth and power business on the road here. And this means that 
very often they have a tin ear for what's happening at the bottom. And this can be very dangerous. And you get a lot of suddenly blowback from unhappy people. And this is how one, one, one of the reasons why John Kashek got run off. Uh, because he didn't, he didn't know how to, how to listen to what was going on at the bottom. So who knows how this is going to work out. The leaders, I think, are pretty frightened of this and trying to be as aware of, as they can of what's happening down below because they recognize there is always an interaction. And if you're going to have correct, correct course at the top, you've got to know what people are thinking down at the bottom. But it's a little unclear how it'll end. Uh, th this gentleman and then this gentleman. Uh, second row, please. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Jing Wang. I'm a correspondent working with the Xinhua News Agency of China. Uh, I have, my question is, uh, Mr. Xiao, your book has put forward a viewpoint that China's rise over the last 100 years also is indicative of the triumph or victory of the Jia or legalism. And uh, why great thinkers in recent China have chosen, all chosen to save China through the promulgation and the practice of legalism? And also, now China has become prosperous. And is it still necessary for China to pursue this uh, doctrine? Thank you very much. Well, he's raising this interesting, you know, in traditional Chinese philosophy and statecraft, there's really two main schools. One is sort of Confucianism with which very roughly uh, ascribes that a ruler rules per force of his moral suasion and example. On the other side, there's legalist theory. And by the way, the first essay that Mao Zedong ever wrote in 19, what, I think it was 1913 or so, was about legalism. Legalism is exactly the opposite. It says a leader got to be really tough. You have to have fair laws, not to guarantee people's rights, but to punish people equally. And everybody's under the law, but the job of the ruler is don't brook any disorder. Uh, you have to make the country wealthy and powerful. That's your job. So these two traditions have sort of collided, intertwined, intermingled, and every leader has had elements of each. And uh, the Chinese Communist Party is the same. So, uh, I mean, this is sort of Machiavelli in China, the realpolitik, sort of the Henry Kissinger school of statecraft. Um, and it's not surprising that there are these different uh, trends. Um, and I don't think you could rule if you were a pure Confucian. And the legalists laughed at the Confucians. They, they, they were just a bunch of blathering, you know, homily giving uh, people who would, who would be ineffective. So it's, we'll have to see how it shapes out. Now the leaders who are demonstrably from a one-party system and Leninists, they're dragging back, you know, uh, the harmonious society and all this sort of Confucian stuff to try to feed the other side of the equation. And so it goes. A, a Confucian face on a different legalist structure. Dick Drobnik, and then we'll go uh, to the third row. Uh, thank you, Clay. Dick Drobnik with the USC Marshall School of Business. Orville, you and Clay have used the word disorder something between 12 and 15 times. Uh, as an economist, um, I wonder what rate of economic growth might lead to a, a much more likely outbreak of disorder in, in a number of places. Is it 6%? Is it 5%? Is it seven and a half? And, and what do you think will be happening over the next few years, given the European collapse, given the slowdown here uh, for their markets? Well, that's an interesting question. China has had growth rates as high as 14%, a kind of a nice average of 10%. I read today in the FT, our growth rate was, and we were crowing about it, 1.7%. China's now 7.5, maybe heading down to seven or a little bit lower. So the question every leader in China is asking, you know, uh-oh, uh, how far down can we go before we're in real trouble? Well, the first thing you have to say is 7.5% growth rate is not bad. But the second thing you have to say is it's not as good as 14%. And the third thing you have to say is 
what kind of a country is this anyway that has these kinds of growth rates? And is that in itself healthy? Doesn't sometime an economy have to kind of stabilize at a reasonable growth rate? Otherwise, you get all these other imbalances, discontinuities, sort of environmental desecration, distortions in, in, in supply and demand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So China is this, you know, kind of been on this bender of development. And their challenge over the next few years is to find a, more, a greater state of equipoise, you know, where they could have a sustainable level. And they don't have this needle in their arm that's demanding these unrealistic, almost mutant levels of development for the place not to fall apart. Imagine if we fell apart at 6%. We'll ask you to define mutant levels of development in just a just a moment. But, Fourteen <laughs> percent. There you are. But the does it matter that China is getting older? That uh, the Chinese population is aging much more rapidly than the United States. We're panic stricken about how we will take care of our elderly. Does it matter that China is getting older? How does that fit with this wealth and power? It's cool. a huge threat. China, in the next 10 years, is going to have a giant bulge uh, at the elderly level of society with an inadequate welfare system, inadequate health care system, and an insubstantial base to support it all. The United States, uh, although you would wonder by, when you listen to the debates on the immigration bill, manages to keep irrigating itself with younger people and I might also add very hardworking people at the lower reaches. I mean, just look at this crowd here. I, I, half of you are immigrants. It's, it's America. And it has a very powerful and, and I think strengthening effect. And it's what makes it imaginable for people like me to collect social security and for you to be able to collect it when your time comes, Clay. We need someone down at the bottom. You heard it here. Shoveling the coal. <laughs> And China is no immigration, and it's going to run into a giant problem with its one child per family uh, policy. Please. Uh, in the third round. Comment. You know, I just finished reading your book. It's incredible. It's a wonderful book. I suggest everybody to buy it and read it. Well, you're, you're, you're very gracious. Please give us your name and then your question. Yeah, my name is Jelko Gis. I'm one of the immigrants, you know. So <laughs> anyway. Uh, the concept of uh, loose end at the beginning mentioned Ipan, Sansha, and uh, an opium war, and victimhood, and creative destruction. These are also very interesting components. I'm just afraid that creative destruction resulted in more destruction than creation in some aspects. Because mm -hmm. you can look at the, at the, at the in industrial production, material success, mm -hmm. and spiritual success. And there are divergences, certainly. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, they are striving to get a civil society. Also in your book, uh, toward the end of your book, there is a wonderful 15, 20 pages on, on Liu Xiaobo. Mm -hmm. And I wish you mentioned his name during this talk because you spent time for him and with him. Liu Xiaobo and other dissidents in a contemporary Chinese cultural milieu. Thanks. Well, yeah, interesting. Um, the reason why we included uh, Liu Xiaobo, who is the Nobel Peace Prize winner who is in jail uh, for 13 years, uh, is not because we thought what he said and represents is sort of the main current flowing through Chinese history. It's a bit of a sideshow, actually. But he is a person that challenges the whole supposition of China's uh, progress through the 20th century and this sort of urgent fixation on attaining wealth, power, and of course the final thing is respect. And what he says is very interesting, and, and ultimately he may be very important to China in years to come as they are trying to figure out how to adopt a different model of statecraft and governance, a different kind of relation between the governed and, 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 and the governors. Um, he says that, you know, uh, you cannot gain respect mm -hmm. and soft power, which is something China's, China urgently wants to gain, unless you treat your people well. And that doesn't mean just feed them. 
or take care of them or give them roads, tunnels, planes, airports, or, 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 or whatever. It means you, you fundamentally respect them and thereby become a respectable society. So this may be China's next great challenge of how to sort of listen to people like that, like Liu Xiaobo, who have been shut out and actually have been mar not tremendously significant in what's happened to China, because that hasn't been China's main agenda. Its main agenda has been restoring itself. So when Xi Jinping came to office, first thing he did, he took the standing committee of the Politburo across Tiananmen Square to the new uh, National Museum, where there was this very rather bombastic show called Fuxing Zhilu, the the rejuvenation of, of the road to rejuvenation. And he did that because he, he, this is such an important theme. And that rejuvenation didn't involve the ideas of any of the democratic thinkers of the 20th century or Liu Xiaobo. It involved wealth and power. Yeah, it involves China occupying a position similar to what mid Ming. 1500, in the year 1500, that China occupied. Except it is mid-Ming, but it has the Qing Empire, That's right. the multi-ethnic empire. Mm -hmm. The Ming Dynasty was half the size of the Qing Dynasty. It didn't have Tibet, didn't have Xinjiang, the Muslim area, Manchuria, didn't have Mongolia, Mongolia, didn't really have much of Manchuria. Uh, and so the PRC was a sort of a, a, a recreation of the multi-ethnic empire of the Qing Dynasty, and the Qing Rulers themselves weren't even Chinese. They were Manchus from the north. Let's, let's go uh, here to the third row here and then over to this gentleman. Thanks. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Leader. I'm formerly of the Council on Foreign Relations, now work on a media fund specializing in co-productions. And uh, as a perfect follow-on to what you were just saying, I feel like we'd be remiss about having a conversation about wealth and power in China and not discussing soft power. So there's been a lot written about the so-called charm offensive, and we know that the five-year plans have benchmarks for example animation and film industry. So I'm just wondering where you would rate, what kind of grade you'd give uh, China in terms of you know, amassing cultural influence and, and spreading cultural understanding, and where you think it falls short and why. Well, you know, China has, has made an incredible effort to sort of project itself with its Confucius Institutes, buying television channels, setting up, you know, very elaborate rep repertorial networks for Xinhua, we have a reporter here today, and the China Daily for um, um, uh, People's Daily. But, you know, I would have to say they haven't succeeded very well. They spent billions of dollars to do this because it's extremely important how China is viewed by foreigners, by the outside. That is something that still, you could say, is almost an obsession. But soft power is not something governments can create. Soft power is something that just sort of arises. You, you all live in L LA here. I mean, Hollywood, it's a mixture of the sacred and the profane, to be sure. But man, does it project. And the government has nothing to do with it. Our civil society is really the glory of the country, in my estimation, and you know is 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 respected all around the world, and it's nothing to do with the government except the tax structure. So this is a challenge China has uh, to recognize that soft power follows a kind of a more relaxed attitude towards letting people create great educational institutions, civil society, cultural organizations that on their own project and make your society one that people want to come to. And you know, for all of its faults, and by God, there are many in this country, people still want to come here. Yes, and in fact, I think many of us were impressed in 2008 by the volunteerism, the, re the response to the map to the massive earthquake in southwestern China, and that gave us a very positive impression. And so allowing people to act on impulse is something that perhaps the government might do more of. Uh, a plug, on November 1st and 2nd, we're looking at just this question uh, here at USC, the question of how China is perceived in the United States, 
the multiple images that people have of China and how America is perceived by Chinese. I'm Bill Guy. I'm founder and chairman of the headhunting firm Cornerstone. We have six offices in China, one in Taiwan. Um, Clay, it may be receding, but you don't have enough gray hair to remember this. Orville and I will remember that when we were younger, made in Japan was a joke. And today it's Made not in a occupied Japan, I remember. <laughs> That's right. Um, to some extent, if they want to be equal, uh, the Chinese do make products cheaper, but sometimes you get what you pay for and they're junk. Uh, what are they doing to, uh, what do you believe they are doing or, or can be doing or should be doing to improve the quality as Japan did? Well, it will happen, and this is very important to the Chinese, that they move up the value chain and that they create products that are, you know, not just low-end, you know, using low-cost labor. And they actually are succeeding, I think, in, 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 in significant measure. Um, you know, this also raises the question of innovation, uh, of, of how innovative can a society become that isn't really an open society. I would just caution Americans a little bit here. Don't rest on your laurels thinking that we have a lock on innovation for the next 20 years because we're in an open society. Um, you know, sometimes innovation depends on some incubation, and the Chinese are damn good at doing this. And they're going to go quite a ways, I think, towards moving up that value chain of quality of more complex things, and yes, they may grab a little intellectual property in the process. Um, and I think if you look at the spectrum of sort of innovation, you can go pretty high. You may not win a whole lot of Nobel Prizes in, you know, in theoretical physics, but you can go pretty high up that thermometer uh, before you sort of hit the glass ceiling that requires a kind of you know, truly sort of blue skying openness. With uh, Xi Jinping's new leadership, uh, I just have a question. I haven't had the opportunity to read. Identify yourself, please. Yes, Leonard S. Johnson, um, AFG, Alliance Financial Group. Um, it's a partnership between China and the U.S. So uh, with Xi Jinping's leadership um, coming aboard, and he's very pro-West that we've understood, uh, what do you think, and I haven't had the opportunity to read the book yet, but I will. Um, what do you think the future encompasses with China and U.S. commerce and relations than what it was beforehand? And what do you see that as far as building the, the bridge, so to speak, given the fact that China controls about, you know, it happens about 2.5 or 1 to 2.2 trillion dollars of the U.S. dollars reserves of our country and then utilizing that to deploy that dollars back into the U.S. economy to build jobs, resources, et cetera. So what is your take on that in the future of those possibilities? Well, I think, you know, one thing you really ought to pay attention to, we all need to pay attention to, is that we're accustomed to thinking of foreign investment flowing from the developed world to the so-called developing world. We are sitting on, the, uh, uh, on a precipice where that's changing where there's going to be increasingly large amounts of capital coming out of China and looking for a place to go. Already it's happening. I mean, it, FDI in, in US and from China is on the level still of Denmark or New Zealand. It's not very much, but it is growing at a very uh, impressive rate. And uh, we did a study on this, and it's called the American Open Door, and estimate that one to two trillion dollars will be coming out of China. So the challenge for America is, are we ready for it? Do we want it? Will we get our proper share? Or will we view Chinese buying Smithfield ham as a national security question <laughs> and want to shut them out? Because that, I think, would be very foolish. This economy, this country, has really thrived over the last century by being the most open economy to investments from everywhere. Now, there may be some national security questions, and surely there are, with investments from any country, particularly China. But we have to really take, we really have to kind of get a little brainwashing on this and, and, and recognize that uh, if you're interested where the money's coming from, it's coming from, it'll come from China. 
And even our governor, Governor Brown, went off to China hat in hand uh, because he recognizes that there could be a good partnership here. So this, I would say, is the next big challenge of the coming decade of our relationship with China. I know there are a lot of people with questions. This gentleman uh, with the hat will get one. I want to thank uh, former Dean Cowan for his incredible service to the people here, passing the microphone around. <laughs> Dean Cowan is a professor of communications. He facilitates it morning, noon, and night. <laughs> kind of like Donahue. Hi, my name is Dr. Liam Sullivan Stone. Uh, I am the chief executive officer of Lovingly Stone Productions, which is a media company and an entertainment source. My background is in theology. So before I go on, Orville Shenson, Shishi Ni Shies Zipong Su Ah Fu Chang Wo Shang Wo Hame O Nian Kasi Wo Shang Hen Hao Ni Gan Kui Chu Nian Hao 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 Gan Kui Chu Mai Ah San Shi Kui Thirty Bucks Okay Anyway What I just said was Thank you for writing this book I haven't read it yet But um, your level of intellect and in the question answer process is amazing So thank you My question is You mentioned earlier um, that there are internal groups that the communist Chinese government are starting to... Hello? We can hear you. Okay, you said that there were internal groups that uh, from an outward, uh, you know, fear or, you know... Uh, Your mic works. I think Hello? All right. Ah! Yeah, please ask your uh, question. Okay, so the question is, you mentioned that there are internal groups uh, that are more you know, to the, the government, especially after the, the communist government has taken over that are more of a threat, or seems like a threat, than external groups. So I guess the most public group that has been persecuted would be the Falun practitioner, Falun Gong. So my question is, what is your take on it? And was there a strategy in the, in the 90s, I believe, right, that the persecution of Li Hongzi and all the practitioners of Falun Gong began? And then how Li Hongzi is now, you know, us in safety here in our country, in the United States. Well, you know, you. China has always, historically speaking, had a deep and abiding uh, sort of uh, fear about these sort of millenarian groups that have something to do with Qigong and, and uh, they tend to have sort of millenarian aspects, which means they think the world may end and they have charismatic leaders and the, the, these could be the boxers, the yellow turbans, the red spears. There have been many, and many dynasties have fallen because of them. So the Communist Party took one look at the Falun Gong, this is under Jiang Zemin, and they said, uh-oh. You know, this has a kind of an end of dynasty smell to it. And when they went out and sat down in this massive demonstration, which they organized via cell phone, a new technology in front of the gate into the leadership compound at Zhongnanhai, they said, that's it. And after that, they sought to totally erase them. Now, in the Western scheme of things, human rights, religious freedom, et cetera, you can look at that and say, not good. The Chinese leaders look at it and say, Let's talk about anxiety within and chaos within, that's what they see and they're not about to let that kind of a group arise again. That was one of the lessons of 1989. You don't let stuff get started. 